The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to discuss synthetic versus organic fertilizer, as well as tomato dishes, canned and fresh you can make. Our guest is Prairie Lawn to Prairie Conversion. Benjamin Vogt would be with us, and we'll answer your garden questions. The hour is full, so join us. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. And welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Happy you've taken time to be part of the program and allowing us to be part of your day. I'm your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner, Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. Happy you're tuning in, whether you're listening to us on one of the 20 AM and FM frequencies broadcasting our program here in 2023 through our parent website, which is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener dot com underneath the season seven tab in studio video replay, podcast replay, radio app, however you're consuming the product. Thank you very much. You want to be part of it. You can do that by sending us an email to Garden Talk Radio at Gmail dot com. Garden Talk Radio at Gmail dot com. Let us know where you're listening from. Also, you can give us a call toll free coast to coast at one eight hundred nine two seven show one eight hundred nine two seven seven four six nine. Well, Holly, at any time of growing season, people will gravitate towards something's not right. I need to add fertilizer. Now, there is multitudes of fertilizers like there is cereal in the aisle at the grocery store. And sometimes it gets confusing on what is good and what is not and what's a money grab and what's fake. Absolutely. And it also kind of depends, I think, on who you ask and and um, how they feel about things or what they use versus, um, you know, just like a lot of people might lean towards if there's two major brands. A, f- a familiar. And, yeah, yeah, familiar. Or I used X because my family has used X for blah, blah, blah years, whatever. Um, so organic fertilizers are great. So they include things like manures, compost, sometimes bone meal, blood meal. These are directed from plants or animal animal sources. And then inorganic fertilizers are things like ammonium sulfate, ammonium phosphate. These are chemical or synthetic fertilizers because they go through manufacturing process. This will all be on the label. Yeah. And they will sometimes be derived from organic deposits, like mineral deposits, but not Always, it just depends on. Well, somewhere down from. the chain of command, it's an organic product in some form or fashion before it's constructed into a inorganic uh, material. I guess is the best way to put it. Yeah, absolutely. So you want to, when you think about this, you want to think about a few things. Is that one? Um, organic fertilizers are less. There's less to apply. So they may cost more, but you don't have to apply as often uh-huh. or as much in organic fertilizers. It goes longer. It goes further for your yeah. dollar. And organic fertilizers are cheaper, but then you might have to apply um, more. But with the organic versus inorganic, the inorganic can be more environmentally damaging than the organic can. Absolutely. And that's the thing is that they are not um they're not absorbed by the soil as much so there's a lot of chance for runoff right and there's science to this now yeah, absolutely now you can go this is science science this is not government science this is true science if you want to go that route and believe certain things there are certain organizations that navigate or create science fact in order to fit a narrative right this is factual yeah this is like plant science right eco, eco science whatever right yeah. So, um, yeah. So inorganic fertilizers usually only contain a few nutrients. So like if it just says on the bag, nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, sometimes they'll have like sulfur included too, but they don't always have anything beyond that. So you get what you get, right? Like you, you know that it's going to have X, Y, Z, and that's pretty much it. Once you have organic fertilizers, you're going to have X, Y, Z, and probably some other nutrients, minerals, etc. Uh, sulfate, uh, calcium, uh, magnesium, uh, some of the macronutrients is what they uh, label them as. And the plants react differently to the type of fertilizer that you are applying. Absolutely. So some some plants will uptake 
uh, the or most plants will uptake the organic fertilizer or the inorganic fertilizer faster than the non-organic fertilizer. Whether it needs it or not. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And, and inorganic bonds to water molecules much more readily than the inor- than the organic can. Yes. So that's one thing to keep in mind. That's um, where you get runoff and algae bloom with the nitrogen uh, increased levels in ponds, streams, and rivers and lakes is because of that nitrogen runoff. And, some, and it's not – it's the over-application in some instances. It's not that somebody's just back on a truck and pouring it in the creek. Oftentimes, the application – oh, if a little is good, a lot's better because I got a problem. Now, I'm not saying the backyard gardener in Kansas City, Missouri is causing the dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico. No, it's, it's a cumulative process. Right. Multitude yeah. millions of people doing a little bit at a time. You feel a pull up a thimble at a time, but if you have a thousand people, it goes a little quicker. Right. And then organic fertilizer or inorganic fertilizers or chemical fertilizers will often make a crust on the soil. And that like, like will, dry coffee grounds. Yeah, like dry coffee I grounds. I mean, not, not, but th- that consistency. Yeah. yeah. And so obviously when there's a crust over your soil, it's not going, if it rains or you water, it's going to be a problem. So you want to make sure that if you are using um, inorganic or chemical fertilizers that you are stirring your soil, cultivating your soil to make sure that you don't have that crust form. Now, again, organic, you can apply too much of that too. The difference in organic is you are just literally pouring money into the ground and the plants are only going to absorb what the plants naturally need to absorb. They will discard the rest. So I just want to talk about that is that um, using organic fertilizer, whatever it may be, but you want to use it properly. Mm -hmm. So, for example, too much of a good thing is bad, right? right? So something like manure, if you don't let that manure age... You're going to burn. You're going to burn your plant. Yeah. So that might be an organic method of fertilizing, but it, you have to wait till it ages. Depends on what, organic in some form of the fashion, because depending on what the animal is eating, the pig, the cow, the goat, the, the sheep, if they're eating chemically sprayed grasses or chemically uh, a spray grain, uh, it's not. I don't think you can call it organic. If they're eating. Uh, right, genetically modified corn, soybeans, sprayed wheat. I just, I just use an example as, that, as, a, like, as a very loose example, right? Yeah. And that you have to make sure that you're understanding, even if it's quote unquote organic, right. what you're putting on it, right? And you are cognizant of what's you're adding to your soil because because of the organic matters, the nutrients, etc., the organic properties, it's going to stay in your soil longer mm-hmm. typically than the inorganic because the inorganic is absorbed faster and quickly by the plants as opposed to inorganic is going to live and build your soil and then that helps build your plants. Now, you don't necessarily need organic or inorganic fertilizer. Look at what nature does. It takes the the dying debris of leaves and allows them to compost in the forest floor and then new plants are, uh, grow next year, the berry bushes, the shrubs, the thorns, all of that. There's not a gnome going around and adding a little dab of fertilizer <laughs> to all the little plants. You don't know that. I've got good sources that indicate that okay. it's not – I've got a better, better chance of Sasquatch than the gnomes. Anyway, uh, we can mimic that in the backyard. Bring in organic uh, compost. Bring, create compost. Take the, the leaves and put in your garden at the end of the season. Let them naturally break down. So you don't have to think, okay, I'm going to garden. I've got to set aside X amount of dollars for fertilizer because that's what you got to have. You don't have to have fertilizer. No, you don't have to have fertilizer, and you can definitely build your soil many ways, and you don't have to add fertilizer. I personally think it's great to add fertilizer as you need it, right? as you really need it, and I wouldn't wait until there's a problem, but I would maybe once a year. Another thing is to keep in mind is that if it's colder out and you're using organic fertilizer, it's going to move slow. Mm-hmm. Just like uh, molasses, the warmer the, the material is, the faster it's going to flow through whatever you're doing. Also, now as we are getting into the later portions or middle to later portions of summer, these garden centers are trying to dump inventory. So if there is a specific type of fertilizer that you feel that you want and you want to have some on stock, now's the time to go. Look for the ads. See what they have on clearance because they, want, they, don't, they, they don't want to hold on to this stuff. 
I don't even know if they can legally hold on to some some it of this stuff. It doesn't necessarily go bad, but I think they just want it off they, their shelves. They want it gone. Yeah, and you, even in the most surprising places, you'll find this stuff on clearance, like a big box store back uh-huh. in the back area of their clearance. You'll find you'll find this stuff. So it's something to and to fertilizer keep in mind. does not go bad if you keep it in a cool, dry place. If moisture gets into it, then you got. I mean, it's still going to work, but you've got clumps and big, you know, popcorn ball fulls of fertilizer. Right. I and I would definitely if you are using an an inorganic fertilizer, chemical fertilizer, you want to make sure you read the storage right. instructions mm-hmm. because some of this stuff is highly combustible. And yes, and f- er, organic and inorganic fertilizer both can come in granular and liquid form. So it's not just a one size fits all thing. There's multiple avenues in order for each one of these type of things. Well, there's only one place, Holly where you can get everything but the meat, and they offer a really sweet coupon code for all of you listeners, and you guys have been using it. It's Walton's Incorporated. Absolutely. As we are heading into canning time, um, meat harvesting time, etc., Walton's knows you care about what's in your food. So Walton's, you can get the equipment, seasoning, and supplies to make sausage, jerky, and any other meat product your way to your high standards. Do you want to make snack sticks that people actually like? That you like? That I like? No, that you... That everybody likes? Because I've made stuff that wasn't that... But I ate anyway because I made it. But you want to make it so you can enjoy it. That beef jerky ones? Yeah. Uh-huh. So anyway, Walton's can help you make some delicious beef jerky that your friends... Turkey jerky, will, deer jerky. ...will want yeah. to enjoy. And then you can give Go- it a... Goose as, jerky's good, too. Goose jerky. Yes. You can give us gifts. Who knows? But anyway, they have everything, their own full line of meat grinders, mixers, sausage stuffers, seasonings, all sorts of great stuff. If you go to waltonsinc.com, they also have a community where you can learn more about meat processing at meatlogistics.com. When you go to waltonsinc.com, you can use grow code use code grow 50 to save 10 percent off your orders of 50 dollars or more when we come back you've got tomatoes either about ready or coming out of the garden there's a lot of different dishes and canning recipes in which you can uh, store and use these we're going to go over several of them when we come back hang out with us you're tuned into the garden with joey and holly radio show have a garden question give joey and holly a call now or anytime 24 7 just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. Grip6 produces American-made products with sleek designs and quality materials. Based and manufactured in Utah, they have high-quality and durable products to last a lifetime. They are built beyond tough. The wallets are low-profile, made out of high-quality aluminum and options to upgrade. Access your cards and cash without bulk. Guaranteed to last a lifetime, it's the last wallet you'll ever need. Your traditional wallet is big and bulky and not easy to access the cards you need conveniently. Grip6 has a quick array access for your cards. You can also add money bands for cash, more cards, business cards, and more. Variable capacity for minimalist or maximalist. Lightweight, sleek, and no wallet bulk in your pocket while gardening, working outside, or enjoying the great outdoors. Designed and manufactured in-house for best results and quality every time. When you purchase from Grip6, you're supporting long life cycle products and American-made manufacturing. Check out their belts, wallets, and socks at Grip6.com. Use code RADIO15 to save 15% off at Grip6.com. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Dripping Springs Oyas clay pot irrigation solves the watering needs for gardens, bushes, new trees, and more. An ancient irrigation system we brought to America. Dripping Springs Oyas, O-L-L-A-S, on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. Check us out. Garden like a pro in three easy steps and receive customized fertilizer recommendations for your garden or lawn. Soil Savvy helps you determine what nutrients your plants need to thrive. Never again overapply nutrients they don't need. A patented process that makes you a smart gardener. To get your soil test kit, go to MySoilSavvy.com. Wind River Chimes creates a symphony in any space. Chimes that are inspired by nature and designed to make the natural world even more inspiring. Music speaks to everyone. Individually handcrafted in Virginia for over 35 years and hand-tuned for an exceptional precision and lasting beauty. Because in life, the winds of change are always moving. But no matter where they carry you, Wind River Chimes will always be the inspiring harmony. 
With a large selection and customization options, you will find the sound that soothes you. Visit windriverchimes.com to shop and find out more. Rootmaker starts your plants off right and keeps them going through harvest. From their seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots to their large variety of grow bags, 1 to 60 gallons. Their products will provide you the harvest you've never seen before. Visit rootmaker.com and use coupon code RADIO23 to save 15% off your order at rootmaker.com. Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardeners, farms, landscaping, and more. To find our products nearest you, visit blueribbonorganics.com. Fleet Farm has everything you need to get ready for the canning season. Pick up all your supplies from start to finish as you begin to harvest your garden. Choose from an assortment of jars, strainers, racks, and funnels. Plus, check out the wide selection of mixes, sugar, vinegar, and more. Get what you need for your everyday life, including canning, at new lower prices. Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Happy Leaf LED, Root Maker, Jung Seeds, Tree Hugger Sprinklers, Verlo Mattresses, Farmer's Defense, Pomona Universal Pectin, Natural Green Products, Mantis Tillers. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show. Farmer's Defense has the tools, the apparel to help your harvesting be much safer and enjoyable. Yeah, farm and garden in the ultimate comfort. Farmer's Defense has lightweight and durable sleeves made to protect you against the elements while farming. Farmer's Sleeves offer unparalleled protection of arms and skin for any farmer, gardener, or outdoor worker. Say goodbye to irritated skin and sunburns in the garden. Their sleeves offer cooling comfort and protection against the elements outdoors. An alternative to thick clothing, Farmer's Defense is made of wicky material with UBF protection factor 50 plus to protect you from allergens and scratches. To find all their great products and more, visit Farmer's Defense. Dot com. We, were, we were on the land and there was some wild raspberries, so I was using my farmer's defense sleeves and didn't get pricked at all. Worked out very well. Oh, yeah. yeah. We were. Mm. And uh, cutting wood as well. You don't get scratched up by carrying the logs around. You have your sleeves. If it's warm outside and you want to prep firewood, works really good. Well, tomatoes, Holly. A lot of them coming out of the garden. Ours will be soon here in the upper Midwest. And there's some things that, you know, what can you do with tomatoes? Well, we eat them. What are the salads? There's canning and there's other dishes in which you can make. Right. And so there's, uh, and a lot of these have crossover okay. where you can eat them fresh or you can can them. Okay. Um, so, for example, salsa. And salsa you can make fresh. You can can it. Some people freeze their salsa. It just all depends on the process and what you're trying to do with it. Just a heads up, if you freeze your salsa, um, it's going to not be the same consistency. The as firmness. You, yeah, the firmness. firmness. It's going to be a little bit mushy, more of like a canned salsa when you pull it out of the freezer. One thing to keep in mind is that um, when you are canning salsa, you want to think about the heat level. If you add a lot of hot peppers, once they go through that cooking process and then you can it, it could get hotter. Oh, they intensify. Yeah. It, mm-hmm. it kicks it up a notch. Yep. And same thing with any hot pepper you add to anything you can or cook. It's It can happen, especially once it sits on a shelf. It's going to intensify. Now, chutney. What What is uh, chutneys here? Chutney is like a... Is it, like it, a, is it a meat jam? It's like kind of like a very loose jam people do put on meat uh-huh. or they'll like dip crackers into it or okay. something. Um, but it's not meat jam. It's like I, I made mango chutney or peach well, chutney. We're talking about tomato chutney yeah, here, so but you can there, make a you, chutney. there's a variety of genre uh, of fruits and vegetables in which you can turn into a chutney. I think it's like either British or Middle Eastern okay. or something. I don't know. I feel like I should probably I should probably explain that better, but it's delicious. People make a tomato chutney. It usually has like a little bit of sweetness to it. A lot of times people will put it on meat because meat can be a little bit more savory and mm-hmm. then this sweetens it up so it makes a nice balance. Um, so tomato soup. Tomato soup is fun to make. It's fun to can and it's delicious. We've made a lot of tomato soup in our day. India. Chutney. Oh, so India. So I was, was kind of close with the yeah. Middle Eastern. So India, yep. Um, ancient, ancient India is where it originated. And if you're not familiar, I would highly recommend looking into chutneys because if you're like, I've canned all the things or I've done all these things with my tomatoes, it's another option. 
Um, so yeah, tomato soup is delicious. That's not something you would typically eat. Cold tomato soup. Cold like gazpacho. Yeah. Yeah. So you could do that. Gazpacho. Um, another one is ceviche. I think there's tomatoes in ceviche. I'm pretty sure because that's like a thing. You can add tomatoes to anything. You can add tomatoes to anything. I mean, realistically, I, I used to make this pasta and I'll make it again. I used to make this pasta dish. Um, Was that the one with the shrimp? This is a different one. Okay. okay. We'll, we'll talk about the shrimp dish in a moment. Yeah. So this was um, tomatoes and then white beans, like cannellini beans and cheese. And I mixed it with pasta and it was delicious. It's a little little different, uh-huh. but it's good. Yeah. Did I eat that? No, I never made it. Oh, that never, okay. Do you want me to make it for you? I, I don't know. <laughs> Talking about dishes that was never made for me. And I used to make it. This is so long ago that uh-huh. I used to make it when I was single. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that was a long time ago. Uh, the dish with it, you had the shrimp too. So it's got the tomatoes in, in, that I enjoy. I don't really know what to call it. So basically I take butter, like a good amount of butter, uh-huh. between half a stick and a whole stick, right. depending on how many tomatoes I have. Melt that down. I chop up a bunch of tomatoes. Or if they're cherry tomatoes, I just toss like probably like what would be a quart of tomatoes mm-hmm. in there. And then I let those cook down, kind of smash them up with my spoon. You add some garlic. You can add garlic before you add the tomatoes. And then... Sometimes I add mushrooms. Sometimes I've added random other vegetables, but usually it's like tomatoes, the butter, garlic, and then shrimp. And then you just mix that all up and put over some pasta. Yeah, it's very good. Uh, if you don't Italian seasoning, is good Italian se- now you can omit the shrimp if you are vegan. Um, you, yeah, you no, could use. Is the vegans? Is, they don't eat any animal they, products. So would that be use, butter as well? Yeah, they'd have to use like vegan uh, butter. But, but if you're vegetarian, you can skip the shrimp. Okay, and uh, you can use something else or just. Skip you could probably it put together. instead of shrimp, you could throw peppers in there. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Uh, so, a tomato gravy. What so, is tomato gravy? It's from what I understand. I've never made it, but I had a southern friend who would make it, and it's basically where you, um, you cook like you're making a gravy where you kind of fry the, the flour and the butter, okay, and then you add tomato instead of. So a lot of times when people are making gravy, they fry the flour into. So it's like making a roux. You fry the flour into the butter, and then you add broth or milk to make like a creamy gravy or. Some sort of broth or like an onion gravy. People will add like those onion packets. So this is where you add tomatoes and then it makes this nice like thick tomato gravy. Well, there's also tomato pie too. Yeah. No, I've I've never... Why didn't you tell the folks what tomato pie is? Well, I've never had tomato pie. I just know (laughs) that is a very prominent staple in some geographical areas of the United States, that it's the go-to deal. Is that the South? I don't know. I, I, oh. I, I'm not familiar with the, the... Somebody's yelling it at the radio. It's, it's us. It's us. <laughs> um, it does, it, I just don't... Pie is supposed to be sweet. I just can't get behind, and I'm sure there's stuff you add to it. You know, we should have looked into what... It, you know, you got to add cheese and, you know, tomatoes and oregano and all that other stuff. Um I got one. Yes. I forgot to put on the list here. Um, so this is a breakfast I make myself is like a hummus toast. And so some people will roast their tomatoes when they do this. I just eat them fresh. But what I do is I take bread, I toast it, and then I spread a nice thick layer of hummus over it. And then I slice up my tomatoes and put that on top. I open, eat it open face. Okay. And then I put like everything but the bagel seasoning on top of that. And it's delicious. Well, I take cherry tomatoes uh, and then I'll smash them. So the juices come out. I'll do this in a warm skillet or a, a cast iron skillet. Pan. Oh, yeah, your bread stuff. Bread stuff. Yeah. And then I'll add a little uh, salt in there and about a half a cup of cream and about two tablespoons of butter. Well, the cream, it, it, based on the number of tomatoes. But essentially what you're doing is you're creating a very savory tomato paste that you then put on bread that's toasted and you can eat it like that. You leave the skins on and it's not bad. You got to do it with fresh tomatoes though. And it, you can vary eight your cream. If you don't have cream, I've used milk before, but it doesn't have the, it doesn't thicken the, the juices from the tomato as well as the, um, the, the heavy whipping cream. You could just eat the tomatoes as a snack and that's how you woo your lover. Uh huh. Do you know why I say that? Because you like cherry tomatoes. Yeah, and because you grew them yes. when we were first dating, and I didn't have a garden, you did, uh-huh. and you would bring me cherry tomatoes, and then I would eat them, and then you kept the tomatoes coming. Yeah, and you stayed <laughs> and around. I get away. Yeah, you didn't go. Away. <laughs> okay, so another one is bruschetta. It's kind of like um, a, a room temperature version of your hot tomato sandwich paste. 
Um, well, so, yeah. let's talk about canning. There's there's the book books and books and books on canning mm-hmm. uh, tomatoes here, but you can do whole tomatoes. Uh, when you when you do hold tomatoes, you do want to peel them, correct? Yeah, you want to peel them, um, or you can put them through the food mill, the food mill, food processor, food mill. Um, so you can do whole tomatoes. You can do tomato um, juice. You can do chunky chunk tomatoes. Uh, pasta sauce. What other things can we do with them? Salsa, yeah. pasta sauce, tomato soup, tomato juice. Um, I feel like I'm, oh, just canned tomatoes. Yeah, canned tomatoes. That was when we talked about removing ketchup. Them. Yeah, ketchup. Barbecue, Barbecue sauce. Yeah. Um, now the thing with ketchup, I grew up with homemade ketchup. It was a luxury whenever we went and got regular, you know, the over the counter store bought ketchup. We made ketchup many years ago, and the recipe instructed to add cinnamon, clove, clove. Okay. Blech. Oh, we we didn't add the clove, and it was much much better. Yeah, I think I called it like country ketchup. Now I'm gonna get. Now we're gonna get a call about that, but um, because I did not like the clove. Right. Yeah. And see the commercial. The now every now there's a lot of organic, but the it was corn uh, corn syrup was what the binding agent is in the commercial. No, it's just a sweetener. The sweetener yeah. agent. Okay. So I buy now when I buy ketchup, I buy the stuff that doesn't have the corn syrup. It's just like sugar flavored or sugar sugar free. Sugar, no, it's sugar cane. Cane sugar or whatever. Yeah. It's, and it has nothing. I have nothing against corn syrup. I'm not going to be like corn syrup is bad. It's just for me the flavor. Uh-huh. I like the stuff. It's too sweet. It's like almost too sweet with, sweet with the corn syrup. It's like eating your sweet tarts with the. <laughs> yeah, with the cane sugar, it just to me tastes brighter. Uh-huh. Yeah. What, so, what does that taste like? Bright. It tastes bright. It tastes bright. <laughs> I don't know. It just it's just preference. What you like. Sometimes when I in, when I have stuff with a lot of corn syrup, it like hits me in the back of my throat in a weird way. So I just get the the cane sugar um, ketchup. So and it's easy to find. It's like every brand has it. Um, so we got oh a tomato sandwich. So this is I think it like kind of started off as a southern thing where people toast their bread. And then they put mayonnaise on it. And there's a certain brand of mayonnaise you're supposed to buy because it's the South. And then I'm sure somebody will catch on to that if they know. And then you put your tomatoes on there, a little salt and pepper, and it's supposed to be delicious. I eat them, but I had cheese because I'm a Wisconsinite, so I uh-huh. make it tomato and cheese sandwich, but it's delicious. Bacon, lettuce, tomato. Oh, yeah, uh, tomato see. pie was brought to Philadelphia by Southern Italian immigrants in the early 20th century. We should make that. Tomato pie? Yeah. Well, when we get the tomatoes, we can. But until then, if you've got uh, beetles, Japanese fl- uh, beetles flying around your yard, uh, and most of us do, it's time to do something about it. And Phylum Bioproducts has though that tool in order to eradicate the Japanese beetles, weevils, and boars. Phylum Scrub Gone and Beetle Gone has a large, wide range of invasive and destructive beetles, weevils, and boars without harming non-targets such as bees, ladybugs, butterflies, Earthworms or other beneficial insects. You can purchase these products locally in Massachusetts at Ward's Nursery, McHugh Garden Center at Hyannis Country Garden, in Connecticut at Van Wilgens Garden Center, in Maine at Salisbury Garden Organic, Salisbury Organics in New York at Fadigan's Nursery in Ohio at Berlin Seeds. Phylum's bioproducts target the pest, not the rest. That's P H Y L L O M bioproducts.com. When we come back, conversion from lawn to prairie. Uh, organizer Benjamin Vogt will be with us. You're tuned in to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Tree Hugger Sprinklers are the ultimate watering device for either your newly planted or established trees and shrubs. Our sprinklers open and close around the trunk of your tree and provide 360 degrees of watering. With our adjustable valve, you can direct the water to your tree's targeted saturation zone. They come in three sizes, 7, 11, and 15 inches. You can purchase a tree hugger sprinkler at your local garden center, feed store, or hardware store. Go to treehuggersprinklers.com to find a retailer close to you. Or you can buy it directly from Amazon or treehuggersprinklers.com. If you're an independent nursery, garden garden center, hardware store, or feed store, you will want to stock this product. Contact the good people at Tree Hugger Sprinklers, and they will get you set up. Your tree's best friend. TreeHuggerSprinklers.com Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit ProPlugger.com 
A non-selective herbicide that is USDA certified? Yup, no more weeds by Naturally Green Products, the same great company that brings you no more bugs, no more weeds kills weeds with no harsh chemicals, and no glyphosate. No more weeds is a commercial grade vinegar base with a proprietary sticking agent. Great around pools, decks, patios, and more. Visit natgreenproducts.com. Free shipping on orders over $50 using code free ship for me. Chapin has the tools for planting your garden and keeping it growing all season long. Whether your garden is big or small, Chapin has sprayers and spreaders for fertilizing, weed, and pest control, watering, and seeding. You can find Chapin products at your local hardware store, big box retailer. You may visit them also online at ChapinMFG.com to learn more and buy online. Hi, I'm Russell Taylor with Live Earth Products. I'm a soil health expert here to help you. Live Earth Products specializes in soil conditioners and fertilizers that will help you build healthy and vibrant flower and vegetable gardens. As our name describes, Live Earth means healthy soils. Live Earth products are humic and fulvic soil amendments and are all natural, organic, and directly from our family Mayan in Utah. Live Earth products are easy to apply and the results will blossom right before your eyes. Live Earth products can be applied throughout the growing season. So pick up Live Earth Humate Soil Conditioner and Liquid 6 Humic Acid at your local garden center or on Amazon. Also available through our website, liveearth.com. That's L-I-V-E-A-R-T-H dot com. Live Earth, here to bring vitality to life in your garden. Jung Seed Company is a family-owned and operated gardening company since 1907 with the largest selection of seeds and plants online. Use coupon code 10TG23 to receive 10% off your order at jungseeds.com. Again, that coupon code is 10TG23. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Aqua-Mart, Soil Savvy, Wind River Chimes, Wisconsin Greenhouse Company, Pro Plugger, Deer Defeat, Dripping Springs Oyas, Phylum Bioproducts. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Moments away, Benjamin Vogt will be with us. But first, a word from our good friends at Rise Gardens. Rise Gardens is a revolutionary hydroponic gardening system for your home. Instead of food traveling hundreds or even over a thousand miles before it hits your plate, harvest the veggies, herbs, and greens you need for dinner tonight in the comfort of your home. No green thumb required knowledge. Gardening made easy with the Rise Gardens app, step-by-step guidance from seed to harvest, a complete garden on a shelf, and comes with everything you need to grow healthy and the freshest food for you and your loved ones. Fully customize your garden to your needs and preferences. For more information, get your Rise Garden, visit risegardens.com. Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Benjamin Vogt is the founder of Monarch Gardens, a prairie-inspired design firm. They specialize in lawn to meadow conversions as well as urban shade gardens. He is also an author, gardener, writer, and landscape designer. Welcome to the program, Benjamin. Thanks for having me, guys. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for taking time out of your schedule to not only educate Holly and myself, but all of our listeners. And I'll start with this. What sparked your interest and got you into the landscaping, design, garden, et cetera? Where, where was that aha moment for you? There were two big aha moments, though. The first aha moment was not exactly an aha moment. It was just sort of indoctrination by the fact that I live with my mother, who was an avid gardener, and I would I would take lots of trips to nurseries with her, uh, more as just a way to spend time with her and get out of the house and away from the rest of the family. Um, both of us were introverts and, and would love to get away from the house. But um, I think that was the first sort of sort of latent gene that was that was placed uh, within me. Um, but later on, once once I got married and my wife and I bought our first house, uh, I started. I just I just dove in the garden. I was like, we are going to have a big old garden. I started with fifteen hundred square feet, which is buying whatever they had at the nursery that I thought would work on our soil conditions. Um, some of those were native plants. Some of those were milkweed. And one day I saw caterpillars eating the milkweed, and I was like, whoa, 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 that's not cool. I spent fifteen bucks on that plant. I'm going to go get some some uh, insecticides and take care of those caterpillars, and then. I said, wait, I'm going to go research this, see what's up. And then I started figuring, hey, all this wildlife around me is using these plants. And, and that's actually what I want. And from then on, it was it was all native plants. It was all habitat. It was all building the garden, not just for me, but for all the life around me. 
Well, and, and we see this in the vegetable world that people who aren't educated see something in that manner. Something's eating it or something's on it. Let's spray something not knowing that it's not only going to kill the bad bug, but it's going to kill all the bugs because it's a non-selective herbicide or pesticide. And they're doing more damage than if they just would back away and go, hey, let's figure this out before I start jumping in head first. Oh, absolutely. And I, I, I tell vegetable gardeners all the time, the best thing you can do if you want to reduce pests is to have wilder spaces around your vegetable garden of native plant gardens that are going to bring in beneficial predator bugs. Like, you know, there's so many, uh, so many of them, including wasps. So uh, it, it's good to have diverse habitat around your veg bed. Fantastic. So you do the lawn to meadow or lawn to prairie conversions. What is that? Can you explain what that is and what the, the benefits are to that it is killing lawn i am a lawn murderer i am a lawn <laughs> killer uh, <laughs> i am so excited about it I'm so excited that more and more people um and demand for our services is just through the roof this year it was a lot last year and it's like double this year so yes we are taking suburban and urban lawns those monocultures that require tons of inputs tons of water and fertilizers and herbicides and pre-emergent herbicides and insecticides and all that nasty stuff that goes into our groundwater and that we drink and that seeps through our bare skin as we walk barefoot on the lawn. We are taking all that nastiness away and adding biodiverse ecosystems native to the region um, that support wildlife, that sequester carbon and clean the air and cool the air and reduce stormwater runoff which is a big deal of climate change right now. We don't get nice soaking rains anymore. We get two inch deluges that happen in 10 minutes. So the more we can keep that water on site, the better and a more diverse landscape is gonna do that for us. Um, so I forgot the second part to your question. You'll have to ask me again. Um, just what what are the benefits to converting the lawn to um, to prairie? And you had answered some of that in regards to the- Yeah, I did answer some. Yeah. <laughs> I think most of that, yeah. Now, I'll ask you this. I know in the West, when people convert lawns to more of a, a environmental, you know, they, they rip the lawns out and put gra gravel in and they get a tax break. Is that similar in Europe in the programs where you're converting it back to native? Or is that not something the government has said this is good yet? Well, not where I'm located here in eastern Nebraska, though. We don't have any tax breaks or programs like that. And those sorts of programs are going to be um, unique to cities and municipalities around the country. Uh, so it just depends on where you where you live. You should you should look it up and see if those those exist for you to help you uh, mitigate the cost of these landscapes. Fantastic. So we talk to a lot of people that recommend native plants, and we agree as well. Um, and just as a reminder for our listeners, why are native plants so vital to everyone's ecosystem? Uh, yes, if we're you know, we are in we are in a mass extinction right now. People have heard about it, and unfortunately, we have caused that mass extinction. And and we see it on a daily basis. We we see it, or we hear it. We hear less of it as far as birds. We we hear so many less bird species now than when we were younger. I think we're all pretty well aware of that. We tend to see less bugs splattering on a windshield. That's been big news in the last few years. There's just less bugs and insects and moths and, and things out there. So many of these species evolved with native plants and evolved to use them. So again, we go back to something like a monarch butterfly. Their larva, their caterpillars can only use milkweed. It's a very specialized relationship. Without milkweed, you have no monarch butterflies. And this specialization is repeated hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of times uh, in, in our native uh, ecosystem. So if we don't have the native plants that our, your caterpillars are using uh, for their leaves, or even there are like something like 25% of our native bee species rely on specific um, a, a specific genus or family or species of native plant to gather pollen from. So if we don't have, uh, support these specialized relationships, we lose pollinators. And we're going to lose plants too because if we don't have the insects pollinating the plants, then the plants can't produce viable seed and create more plants and create more habitat. And if you think about birds again, right, birds – most songbirds feed a steady diet, almost 100 of, percent of, of moths and butterflies and caterpillars to the young for the two weeks or so that they're in the nest. So insects are the base of the food chain for so many species. So if we don't have the insects, we don't have the native plants to support them, we are in big trouble. Now, obviously, native meaning local to the person living there. It's different in Kansas City versus Denver versus Pittsburgh. How can somebody mm -hmm. find out what is native to their particular geographical area? Where, where is a good source to start at? 
Uh, I think I should plug myself right now. No, I shouldn't. That's so bad. No, it's good. Uh, I, you know, like I have an online class on my, on my website, monarchguard.com. That is, uh, it's about how to start your native plant garden. And it goes through all the different resources. And some of those resources include just entering your zip code at websites like Audubon Society. Um, oh God, what are the other ones? There's so many Xerxes Society, Pollinator Partnership. They just have you put in your zip code and you can just start that way. The lists aren't exhaustive by any means. They're sort of baby lists. But you can start to explore that way. Um, and then, of course, uh, reading my book, Prairie App, is going to launch you um, a, a long ways into figure out what's native to you. Do you find the people who aren't are not aware of what you do convert the conversion? Are they like you're resistant? Or are they curious or are they like, yeah, OK, let's do it. Uh, let, I'd like to have you do it in my lawn. Or is there some convincing that has to go along in this? Oh, it's all those things. It highly depends. I mean, I, I have been on garden installs where we are converting a front lawn and a small front lawn at that for this one I'm thinking about. And a neighbor walked across the street and just yelled at me, right? <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I'm just like, I'm just the guy installing the plants. If you want to learn more about it, I'm happy to talk with you about it right now. But, you know, he stormed off and that was the end of that. Uh, I, I have had some... Some neighbors walk across the street and express interest in it. We have a nice little conversation about it. But, you know, I share pictures of my home home landscape headquarters all the time on social media. Uh, and, and folks ask, have you have you convinced any of your neighbors or any of your neighbors come up and said, hey, you know, I'd really like to try to do, do that in my own landscape. And I'm, I'm like, no, no, I have convinced nobody. Uh, lawn is so entrenched in our culture and our psyche and our identity, even though it's only been around for 50, 60, 70 years. Um, so even when we do these landscapes, I don't think we're convincing neighbors. Um, I think we have this general idea that a garden, I'm putting garden in quotation marks here, uh, a garden is a lot of work, right? It's a lot of upkeep. You got to know a lot uh, to manage it. Uh, but you're not out there having to mow every week. You're not out there having to water once or twice a week uh, like you are with a, well, here we have tall fescue lawns that have to have an inch of water a week. You're not having to apply fertilizers especially if you're matching plants to site conditions, the soil, the drainage, the sunlight. Um, it's a right plant, right place mentality. So I am, you know, I had the mow today for 10 minutes. We've got like 500 square feet of lawn left. And I, I just, I just want to kill the rest of the lawn. That 10 minutes was way, way too long. Um, the rest of, with the other native plant beds, I don't have to do any kind of maintenance like that. So, so aside from, aside from people, um, getting rid of their whole lawn what are some ways that people can kind of make their lawns more prairie friendly gradually work in gradually work into that because you know people are used Mm -hmm. to having their lawns they're kind of many people are kind of addicted to that so um what's a way that you know people can work into it or maybe just have a portion or what can you kind of encourage people to consider unlawning themselves yeah i mean the easiest way we, we probably all have foundation beds around around our house and the easiest, easiest thing you can do is put an aster out there. And once that thing blooms, you can just sit there and, and you know, all day long and enjoy the thousands of insects that come to it and just realize, wow, this is really cool. Look at all the support that this one aster plant is giving to such a diversity of insects coming to use this plant for food. Um, but then the next easiest step is, you know, once you get hooked that way, is just to deepen those foundation beds around our houses. Most house, most foundation beds in my neighborhood are only about two or three feet deep. That's not enough to support anything and create a sustainable, low-maintenance ecosystem. So doubling and tripling the depth of our beds around our house to maybe something like 10 feet um, is, is a wonderful start. And you'll still have plenty of lawn um, to throw a Frisbee around, even though you can certainly throw a Frisbee in a meadow, too. And, and you talked about, you know, you're not having to mow every week. People may be concerned, and you know, the prairie in the prairie, there's not gnomes going around and weeding or cutting things down. What level of maintenance or requirement is needed once this thing is fully installed and you've converted over to a prairie yard, essentially? Once, yeah, once it's fully installed and everything is in balance, and this can take a year or two or sometimes three or sometimes more. It depends on if you're using seed or, or potted material, how, how fast things are going to fill in and establish. But once it's fully established, we're pretty much talking about occasional weed control, especially tree seedlings. That, that seems to be the biggest issue. 
uh, and, and then you're talking about a, a annual mowing out here in eastern Nebraska. We're doing that about early April every year. Once the soil temperatures uh, stick at 50 degrees Fahrenheit or higher, then you can start to mow things down. Um, and that's that's really about it. If you have done the right plant, right place, right plant community, you've mashed all the plants together and the site conditions and everything is knit tightly together with lots of deep layers, ground covers, and two-foot-tall plants and four-foot-tall plants, uh, it, it, it's really quite self-sustaining. Um, of course, there are caveats to this conversation and site-specific and region-specific, but generally, it is not mowing every week. It is not watering every week. It is not fertilizing four times a year. None of that. Fantastic. Now you had talked about the milkweeds for the monarchs. What are some other plants that are beneficial to monarchs? Because you see these um, signs that this is a monarch official garden, etc. And I've seen those gardens. They don't all have a ton of milkweed. They have some milkweed mixed in. Are there any other plants mm -hmm. that are beneficial to the monarchs? Of course, pretty much any native plant out there is going to be beneficial to the monarch because uh, we're mostly seeing, you know, for, for the most part, monarchs are adults, right? They're not caterpillars for very long. Um, so they need flowers and they need a diversity of flowers and they need a diversity of flowers blooming at all times of the year. And so do all the other butterflies and moths and bees and, and, and whatever out there. They need flowers blooming all the time. Uh, so really any native plant out there is going to be putting out flowers is going to be beneficial. You don't really need that much milkweed. Um, it's just it's just a small a slice of the pie. Well, Benjamin, we greatly appreciate the time you've offered us and the amount of information you provided. How can people find out more about you, your website, your book, and those classes you spoke about earlier? Yeah, online classes, webinars, uh, downloadable garden plans, and, and you can take a workshop with me. All that good stuff is at my website, monarchgardens.com. Monarch you can just Google Monarch Gardens, Benjamin Vote really hot, sexy prairie garden designer, and you'll probably, <laughs> <laughs> you'll, you'll, you'll find it. And then, of course, my books are Prairie Up and then uh, A New Garden Ethic. Well, Benjamin, again, we thank you for your time and the information uh, for being on the program. It's, it's a pleasure. Thank you guys so much again. Absolutely. And when we come back, it's your garden questions, our garden answers. You're tuned in to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now, 1-800-927-SHOW. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Do you know that overwatering and underwatering are the top causes of plant death? Tree Diaper solves both those problems by absorbing excess water and releasing it back when the soil dries. Use code GARDEN15 to save 15% on TreeDiaper.com. Aqua-Mart.com has everything you need for eye-pleasing outdoor water features on your property. For over 25 years, we've been creating and field testing beautiful water features in order to provide you with the most reliable products and best value in the industry. From easy-to-install pond and water filled kits to pumps, fish food, and more, you'll find everything you need to install and maintain a naturally balanced water feature in your yard. Make your backyard a true oasis and maintain it well. Visit Aqua-Mart.com to shop for all your needs. You put a lot of time and energy in your garden, but without a rescue Japanese beetle trap, you can kiss that hard work goodbye. Asparagus annihilated. Raspberries ravished. Green beans, forget about it. Get those little invasive pests out of your garden and send them where they belong inside a rescue Japanese beetle trap. Now with available refill lures, rescue Japanese beetle traps can be used for multiple seasons. They're made in the USA by the makers of the popular rescue fly and yellow jacket traps. Learn more at rescue.com. That's R-E-S-C-U-E dot com. Deer Defeat is an all-natural based animal repellent to keep deer and rabbits away from your valuable plants that is odorless after 30 minutes and dries clear. It creates a continuous invisible shield to protect your plants. Works for 30 days through rain, snow, and freeze. Will not clog your sprayer. Apply to your property without environmental damage. You can spray directly onto your plants up to flowering, then apply around your plants to continue protection. No need to reapply. 
money back guarantee. To purchase, go to DearDefeat.com and use coupon code RADIO to save 10% off your order. You know what's different about Verlo Mattress? Everything. Like no price gouging, no shenanigans, none of the shady dealings of other mattress chains and furniture stores that overcharge for virtually the same mattress. The ripoff stops here. Verlo makes every mattress they sell, so you get better quality, lower prices, and a lifetime comfort guarantee. Because at the end of the day, you don't deserve shenanigans. You deserve a good night's sleep. Wake up. Sleep better. Verlo. The Gardening with Joy and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Dripworks, Rise Gardens, Grip6, Bloomin' Easy, Fleet Farm, Waltons Incorporated, Blue Ribbon Organics, Tree Diaper. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Join Holly Radio Show. Thank you for being with us today. Time for your garden questions, our garden answers. You've got a question, send it on over. Garden Talk Radio, gmail.com. That's Garden Talk Radio at gmail.com. Or you can jam your fingers in the phone and give us a call at 1 800 927 7469. 1 800 927 7469. 1 800 927 Show, toll free coast to coast. If we can't get to you, leave a message and we will call you back. Holly, we have our first question is sponsored by Fleet Farm and FleetFarm.com. Your show is a tremendous help to gardeners. I appreciate it. The last few years, chiggers have been a problem in our garden. Is there a way to get rid of them? Thank you for any advice you can share on the topic. Okay. Chiggers are, for those who are not aware, they're very tiny. You don't see them. Um, they're basically... Um, they're like little little bitey gnats. Yeah. The yeah. gnats that bite. The, yeah. and, and you don't know they've bitten you until about two days later and right. they itch for about three weeks. It itches forever and they're these little like raised bumps on your skin whenever they bit you. Okay. Yeah. So, there's a couple of things in which you can do. You can keep your grass cut shorter than what is recommended. Typically, a recommendation of height of grass is two and three quarters to three and a half inches. You can keep it cut shorter. You can also add diatomaceous earth to kill chiggers by dehydrating them and preventing their body fluids from circulating properly or by slicing them with a sharp, uh, slicing it with a sharp um, granular. granular. Explain yeah. what diatomaceous earth is because you said that this is not a very nice product. <laughs> it's No, it's not. It's a very gritty product. and It's, it's a natural product. It's a natural product and it's... Um, it's mined, I believe. Yes. Um, and it's used to get rid of a lot of soft body insects, which includes chiggers. And basically, for one, they consume it, it dehydrates them, or if they're crawling through it, it's going to slice them up. And that's what it does. Yeah. It's yeah. Um, not. If a- you have pets, though, you do have to be a little, I believe you have to be careful with it. You do want to apply it according to the directions. Yeah, follow the directions, but it's a very organic and natural means of uh, dealing with insects that uh, you're not happy with. All right, um, next question. But not all insects. Not all insects, right. What are some easy-to-save seeds? Well, the key to seed saving is make sure you can find that the seed is fully developed and intact. So some of the easiest seeds to save are things like peppers, beans, watermelon, any sort of squash, pumpkin, um, leeks, and corn. And then a lot of times if something develops a seed pod, you can save that. You would just have to look and make sure that it does um, it does dry out. And then you can save those seeds like radishes and kale. lettuce. Yeah, kale. Lettuce, um, yeah. Dill. Yeah. Uh, with the leeks and the uh, kale and other brassicas, two years on that deal. And then with the corn, you want to leave it on just like field corn. You want to wait until it completely dries. If you're wanting to save it for seed and you don't care if there is the opportunity or a chance that cross-pollination has occurred from uh, patches throughout the neighborhood or the countryside, that if you're going to save the seed, you're, you're going to pick up some genetic traits um, in that. Uh, pumpkin, or, uh, tomatoes, people, I want to save tomato seeds. I want to save tomato seeds. You can do that. You want to leave the tomato on the vine as long as possible, basically rotting it on the vine. Then you're going to extract, you're going to take a mason jar, a wide mouth pint jar, and squeeze the seeds out of it. 
going to cover. You're going to add just a little bit of water. You can use any jar. Any jar, yeah. but I use wide mouth because you can get your hand in there and but stir it. you can them. use like an old mayonnaise jar. Right. It doesn't have to be a mason jar. Um, for those who are, don't understand that, uh, mayonnaise jars used to be made out of glass back in the day. Um, and you want to take and squeeze the seeds out of the tomato itself and then add a little bit of water. Cover it with a coffee filter or a rag. It's going to ferment for about three days, 72 hours. It's going to have a little smell coming off of it. At that point, then you want to drain the liquid off and catch the seeds. What is occurring is that fermentation is eating away at the seed or that gelatinous slime around each seed that the tomato has inside of it. It's a protective layer that protects the seed as the tomato falls in the ground this fall that it won't start germinating until next spring so it can be done and with any seed saving you want to mark what your seeds are so you remember because you will forget if you don't absolutely so our next question is why do you add acid lemon juice for canned tomatoes even if you are pressure canning them um it's just for freshness and in the water bath world you add it as an acidic yeah for safe preserving yeah so for uh the tomatoes it's just a freshness thing um, it's just something I learned along the way. Okay. Uh, next one. I live in Atlanta and I bought a house and have a huge space to garden. I want to get some plants established now. How do I find advice on what to plant that is native? Yeah. So first of all, congratulations on your new home. And second of all, I would go to your local independent garden mm-hmm. center um, these people are going to be able to help you. They might recommend some natives, and they also might recommend something else. Um, Whether this person, you're shade or, or sun, yeah, this perennial person, or annual. This person provided a picture, and I would love, I would have loved to help them. But the thing is, is I don't live in Atlanta or the South, right? So I don't have a great deal of native plants to to grow there. Also, and how they would how they would grow best, and maybe how you can combine them. That's not my my expertise um they also wanted to know how to what kind of how to get some big containers and i advise that you can get those at garden centers garden stores that was a good time because they're yeah they're they're probably marking them down yeah so um if you ever don't know like hey i have this space here and i don't know what to plant here you can certainly go to your local garden center and local independent garden center take some pictures show them what you're looking for and they can help you with that you're going to your local independent garden center just don't go to the first one that comes up when you go your favorite search engine and type in local independent garden center in my area there might be three there might be 13 look at the ratings look at what people have wrote because just because bill's independent garden center is down the street doesn't mean bill's independent garden center is very good Right, and some of them will have kind of specialties. Some will be better for vegetables, and some will be better for flowering plants and shrubs, and some of them will just have better-looking um, yard signage and containers. The one so, that we deal with has uh, all of that. They have yeah, people like complete... on staff that know everything. If Bill doesn't know, Sarah knows. If Sarah doesn't, there's a chain there that everybody knows a little bit enough to help you out. It's a complete garden center. Right. Yeah, for sure. And you can always call ahead saying, say, hey, I'm coming in to do X, Y, Z is or to accomplish X, Y, Z or look for whatever. And they will be like, yes, um, you know, we'll have make sure blah, blah, blah. You know, that's Jane and she can handle that. And she's here on Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, whatever. Yeah. And like the individual that wrote us, have some photographs and know if the plant or the area is shaded partially shade full shade or full sun because that's gonna the more information you can tell somebody who has knowledge about the plants and is a garden center the better more accurate and happier you will be three five and ten years down the road because they have given you an annual or perennial that will come back year after year a shrub a tree that is designed or can adapt to that particular location that you want something to fill in What's funny is that one of my friends asked if I ever feel bad for saying, like, I don't know, or referring the question to somebody Joe else. Joe Lample said that was the best yeah. thing you could ever and say. That's, that's what you can do, because I could I could Google this, like some native plants for Atlanta, but I don't know anything about that. But when you Google yeah. that for some plants, for there's 400,000 right. different articles, and who knows how many of them are just saying something, so you click, and they get their little nickel every time you click on a link. Absolutely. So just keep in mind that we want to help you, but sometimes we don't know. We don't, we're, I'm not from the South and 
I have no idea. So that's why you, I can prefer, refer you to someplace that's going to be better. Well, with that being said, Holly, we are out of time, and we thank you for yours. Miss any portion of the program today or would like to revisit it? Send, an, uh, send us an email at gardentalkradio at gmail.com, and we will send you a link to the program. You can find all past shows at our parent website, the Wisconsin Vegetable and uh, and our videos there. Tune in next week to the program where we will be discussing building your soil for a better garden next year, as well as fall bulb planting. And our guest will be author Melissa K. Norris, homesteader and author, will be with us. So until next week for... Hi, Baird. I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs> <laughs>